The cleaning industry is transforming faster than ever. New chemical innovations, intelligent sensors, robotic systems, data-driven tools, and more are all converging to redefine how cleaning really gets done. And this shift isn't subtle. It's a full-on evolution. So, if you want to stay ahead of the curve, this is the episode you want to watch from beginning to end. The insights you'll hear today will help you understand where the industry is heading, what technologies are truly worth your attention, and how to make smarter decisions in the months and years ahead. It's my guest today, Brandon Beyer. He's with Univar Solutions, and he's coming to us from the Rocky Mountains in his traditional orange shirt. Brandon. Thanks, Jeff. Te- <laughs> Technically, I'm coming to you from Minnesota. Um, I just spend a little vacation time every year um, extending the cold uh, in the Rockies uh, snowboarding. So when it starts to melt snow here, it isn't at 9,000 feet, so that's where I go. So, yes, I work for Univar, but I like to say I think what I actually really sell is cold and snow. Please embrace it. Um, and if you can hear it in the O's in my, my, my speech, I am a proper – native born in Minnesotan, but yeah, happy for the time to, to talk today. Absolutely. I can't wait to get into our discussion and we'll do that in a second. I, I just love that picture. I'm glad you use it on your meetings and recordings. Uh, different world compared to my cornfields in Ohio, that's for sure. <laughs> Fair <laughs> yeah. enough. Well, Brandon, let's set the stage a bit. Can you walk us through your role in R&D at Univar Solutions and how you're tracking those four major forces we're going to talk about? Chemical innovation, smart tech, biome control, robotics, and anything else you'd like to share to get us started? Yeah, so uh, my role within Universe Solutions is um, application development specialist. I actually uh, manage the team in North America. And what an application development specialist or an ADS for short is, uh, first and foremost, customer-facing technical support. Sometimes I joke I'm you know the traveling chemist, the traveling nerd. But, but let's get into it, Brandon, and talk about, first of all, the first one, chemical innovation. What breakthroughs or formulation pathways are you seeing now that weren't in the picture just five years ago, and why are they accelerating? You know, I would back up a bit. I would say chemical innovation, there isn't, to be, to be true, a lot of brand new molecules entering the market, especially in, in uh, the cleaning segment, um, mainly from regulatory constraints like, like Tosca. It's hard to bring a new molecule to market. That being said, old molecules made in new ways are present. So what I mean by that, that is a lot of times new feedstocks, far more sustainable processes, something that might have been made from petrochemicals in the past might be coming from a offshoot of a, you know, a a bio-based feedstock now. So it's old molecules made in new ways. I mean, there's even so much as um, lower alcohols being derived from soldier flies. So you can... (laughs) If you'd like to take that offline, um, you know, that's not necessarily a a vegan option because you're literally grinding up billions of flies to get, you know, a feedstock, but it's a very real innovation. So the new molecules, I would say, are are not as frequent where you're seeing more of that is in the biotech space. So there are, you know, a constant evolution in terms of enzymes and microbial products entering the market, just not quite as many brand new surfactants, keelants, polymers. So that's why flies are important. (laughs) Flies are black soldier flies. Yes. Um, Again, I'm a chemist first and foremost. I find that stuff super interesting. It is. But the reality is when you go into an engineering, you know, a a massive site when they're taking petrochemicals, there's really good, efficient ways to make these molecules. That's just another interesting way to to approach, a, you know, um, a synthetic challenge. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, let's talk about smart technology next. Talk about sensors, IoT, data data platforms, automation, how that's influencing the cleaning practices we see, and what are the barriers to adopting all this? That's a mouthful. So the barrier a lot of time with smart technology, you'll see it in home care, right? The, the machines are improving, but in the industrial market, this has been going on for a very, very long time with like an industrial washing machine. So when I think smart technology, where it's really helping the industry, one, is proving you're doing what you say you do, at like a much larger scale. We are cleaning, we're proving we're cleaning, this is your dosing, Um, it's optimization. And what it's really optimizing is like water consumption, energy consumption, air quality, how much are you spending in in these limited resources? 
smart technology helps you prove it. You can say, well, I turned down the water, I turned down the temperature. If you have a monitor that actually links like a washing machine to your um, utility sensors, you can actually start proving the value you're gaining. Now in Jansan space, right? Uh, the person purchasing the chemicals or the ingredients for their, their site isn't always the same person paying for utilities bills. So smart technology can help link those two and show how like a, a you know an actual service provider is adding a lot more value to a customer than you would think. But for uh, spots that I'm really interested in is like hygiene analytics and reporting, like at a hospital. You really want to prove you've cleaned the floors, you've cleaned the beds, you've done everything. Um, because the, the consequence of failure is very high with like a healthcare acquired infection. And then data-driven product dosing is really important. It's optimization. So smart technology is not as much a, a, a chemistry evolution, but it's helping drive key pillars like labor, time, temperature, and sustainability. No, I see that they're all tied together and even more so now. So thank you for that. I want to talk about the next one, biome control. I have to admit, really? I wasn't really sure what that was. I did a little research. So we're not just about talking about removing soil, but we're talking about managing microbial ecosystems. So we are talk about yeah. that. How's that evolving? So that, that, I mean, evolving, great pun there. You know, it's a growing industry. That's a joke. I never get sick of, um, so biome control literally is using, uh, microbes and microbial cleaners as part of the cleaning process. This is not new. Uh, microbes have been used in things like poultry litter and the food industry in, in um, related to the food industry, but to reduce malodor. So think of microbes as little tiny enzyme manufactories. Um, and when they're on the surface, they continue to clean. This solves a problem for, again, a Jansan industrial cleaning space because they're, they offer continuous cleaning. They don't work immediately. It takes a little while for the machinery to turn on. But while they sit there on the ground or on a surface and they have a little bit of water, a little bit of time and food, which is the soil, they excrete whatever they need to excrete to break it down, turn it into food. And then every time you clean, you're washing that away. This has the added benefit of helping can actually offer some biome control. We all have an idea of good bacteria and bad bacteria, right? And this way you can control because the, the cust like customers or suppliers of ours, like Novanesis, they have a strain of like five bacillus that are all safe. They're great. It creates a healthier biome. And you can prove this where you start cleaning with these microbial products. And then a week or two later, you take swabs around the location and you've changed the biome to something that's much more conducive to better health. There's no staff. There's, you know, like it, basically it is, you're, you're, you're creating the healthy environment. People would call these probiotic products. We try not to call them probiotics in the cleaning space because it suggests food. We don't want you eating these cleaning products. Um, I think the jury is still out on what you call them microbial or microbiological, bioenzymatic or probiotic. But I think probiotics a little more comfortable to consumers because they're familiar with it for like good bacteria in terms of the gut. It's just we're applying the same type of concept, good bacteria in a cleaning environment. Yeah, that analogy works. We all understand that. So, okay, our fourth one is robotics. So we are talking about automatic scrubbers. We're talking about drones, autonomous equipment. Now that's not a chemical, but talk about how this has changed and what makes this force more relevant to you now. So robotics are fun, um, partly because they make great TikTok videos and Instagram videos and whatnot with Roombas. Uh, so, but you're going to hear me pitch this a lot. Anytime you hear me talk, I talk about the cleaning wheel. Temperature, time, mechanical action, chemistry, and the center is water. Those robots, you know, they, they save humans time. They're using the temperature and they're just mechanical action, a sweeper. If you want a cleaner that does more, there is chemistry in there. They all have a hopper or some type of spot to put a cleaning solution in. So getting more out of that robot and what it's doing requires a chemical solution. How often does it need to go around on the floor? Robots also tie into smart technology, right? You can see the GPS. Did it get all the spots on the floor? How frequently is it running? If you incorporate a microbial product in a robot cleaner, every time it goes by, it cleans once immediately and leaves microbes behind 
that continue to clean after the fact. So that when the robot or a person comes by later on, uh, you know, it's just the, all of these instruments are playing together. I just don't always think people see the full matrix and how they're all interconnected. But if you were able to attend ISSA this year, you saw a lot of robots. They keep advancing. They keep getting smarter. But almost all of them have a chemical solution in there. So though one of our solutions isn't selling robots, we are helping provide you know ingredients to those robots to clean better. You mentioned uh, the video clips we see with uh, Roomba. Are you talking about the cat riding the Roomba, or when the Roomba eats someone's hair? I both. Okay. You know, it's it's all great marketing. We're going to look back at the past. So thinking about the past five years. Yes. And you are looking at the next five. What patterns or lessons do you see that are on your radar? Sustainability is not a flash in the pan. It's not a trend. It's not like it's, like, it's not going away. The consumer is asking for it. It's going to keep evolving and growing. Regardless of what we see in news, media, opinions, um, people have spoken. They want to continue to make better, cleaner, more sustainable technologies. Whatever that means. And they want it with a, like uh, like actual real life authority, not greenwashing. So you need, if you say you're green, you need to prove what that means. So that was a trend. It is industry standard now. Um, where we're coming from, I think the, you know, AI is a, is a buzzword. So one might say my concept of smart technology is what AI is becoming and how is it going to influence the, the industry, chemical innovation. Uh, you know, the pharmaceutical industry has done combinatorial reactions for a long time. There's no reason that what we consider as designed experiments don't just keep getting more complicated or easier to do because of basic AI looking at, okay, you did these three cleaning experiments, we know the best solution. So I think everything I've talked about, the chemical innovation is going to be accelerated by smart technology or AI. Robots will become smarter because of however this concept of AI is just, it's learning technology. So where we were like the last five years, I would say is just kind of status quo, moving from the world of phosphates, non-phenol ethoxylates, hot temperatures, uh, started slow and it's just accelerated. So if you're not in front of sustainable technology that save you time, cost, energy, manpower, um, you need to accelerate and lean into the, some of the policies, the principles and chemistry that we've talked about. Good advice. Speaking of which, we're about out of time. So any words of advice or thoughts to consider for those watching that you want to share with them as we end our program? Yeah, you know, um, it's always, we're all solving the same equation in this industry, you know, and it's basically temperature, time, mechanical action, and chemistry, all added up in some version to create this nebulous thing called cleaning. Now, time, temperature, you're trying to reduce or increase whatever. As a chemist, I'm always bringing, you know, chemistry ingredients, um, especially within in my space, especially ingredients to really drive that equation. But if you're in this industry, just remember, there's an intuitive understanding by everyone of what cleaning is. And it all comes back to that. And the center of that wheel is water. So just never lose sight of that. And you'll be able to make some pretty significant contributions in this area.